Today we're going to be talking about containers. Where did that come from? Hey guys, and welcome to the show. Today we have Ryan Berry uh, back with us, and he's going to talk to us about containers. And I, again, I don't really know what containers are, but I came prepared. <laughs> How's it going, Ryan? It's going well. How are you doing today? Man, I'm doing good. So I really don't know what containers are. Um, I'm not lying. I uh, uh, am interested to find out, though. Um, this seems like a topic that you were fairly passionate about. So I trust yeah. you. And uh, uh, explain to us a little bit about you know, what a container is. Absolutely. So... Uh, when, when you think about, you know, your, when you have a need to deploy a test environment or you're building a new application or, or um, um, you know, standing up a new, a new service for, um, you know, for, you know, whether it be for testing or production services, you know, a lot of companies have, you know, virtualization in place. You know, that's what, you know, the cloud brings to the table as well to bring, you know, cloud-based virtualization services. Um, but there's a lot of horsepower that goes behind that particular server. So if you have something like a, you know, simple web application and you are doing, you know, you're a developer and you're um, doing work on your development development machine, typically you have a lot of other stuff on your machine, you know, other, you know, frameworks and tools and, and that sort of thing. Um, and oftentimes the developer wants to be able to test their application in a pristine controlled environment uh, that doesn't have all of the other stuff, you know, different various versions of frameworks and, and that sort of thing that they have in their machine. Um, so a container allows a, a isolated way to stand up a, you know, service or application on, on a machine. That machine could be your developer laptop or server, you know, in a production environment, um, you know, running on top of your host, uh, of your, your host operating system. So instead of spinning up a virtual machine where you need to, you know, if you have 16 gigs of physical memory in your laptop, for instance, instead of, you know, spinning up a virtual machine that has 8 gigs of memory and then taking 8 gigs of memory away from your, your developer machine, um, you're, you're sharing all of the, the resources that are on your machine, um, you know, for, you know, an isolated environment to be able to run something in and that something could be you know an application it could be you know an ubuntu operating system it could be mysql uh, or a combination of all of that so yeah. so some pretty pretty cool way to be able to um you know to, to you know for, especially for a developer standpoint to be able to test applications and then from a production standpoint you know, we can talk about some cool things you can do with that um, as well I, I have a couple slides i can show if uh, kind of get uh, get some discussion started and then we'll launch into some demos Okay, that sounds great. So, Lex, this is a this is a picture illustrating what I was just talking about. That you know, when you stand up a a virtual machine, um, you're actually duplicating you know the guest operating system, all the libraries needed to you know support that guest operating system, and then ultimately you know provides a receptacle for you to deploy your application into. So, if you have multiple of those, um, you, you're you know duplicating that guest OS, which you know typically has a fairly significant footprint, you know, irrespective of whether or not it's Linux or Windows. Um, you know, there, there's some hefty resource requirements for some of the modern operating systems to be able to, to accommodate that, that picture on the left. Um, whereas in the container space, you have the host operating system uh, and then a, a um, you know, some sort of container service. You know, Docker is certainly one of the, the more, um, you know, the, the more widely used one. Um, and also is one that's available in Azure that we'll talk about here in a little bit. Um, so you have this engine that sits on top of the host operating system. And it allows you to spin up, you know, these these silos, if you will, that you can deploy stuff into. Um, and those silos can actually contain operating systems. So I'll show you uh, in a demo in a little bit. You know, we can spin up a uh, a Windows server, or a Windows Nano server as a container. Uh, we can actually on my Windows desktop, I can also deploy um, like a a WordPress site using um, Ubuntu and MySQL. Um, so you know, the, the Windows 10 operating system has, supports container services with the anniversary update, uh, allowing you to, to run both Windows and Linux-based operating systems on top of the, the Docker engine, or, or I shouldn't say um, operating systems, I should say applications would be a more suitable word. So, so it's, a, it's a difference in, in a different approach in being able to make more effective use of hardware instead of having 
you know, those blue boxes on the left that typically take a lot of resources to, you know, to, to you know, for the, the hypervisor to manage and, um, and um, you know, coordinate. Yeah. So it looks like what we're doing, hang on, go back what? for a second. Sure. Yep. So it looks like what we're doing is virtualizing the OS or making, making the OS available to these virtualized containers. Yeah, and it's and it's not the actual OS. So as an example, um, you know what? This would be a, a really good time just to show you. So Lex, what I what um, what I'm going to show here in a second is a um, a Windows Nano server. And you know, the interesting with the Windows 10 anniversary update, we've made available the ability to run um, you know the the Nano server. Um, you know, from a licensing standpoint, you can actually download these images, and these images are, you know, the actual containers that have a kind of the, the, the bits needed to make this particular service function. Um, you can actually download those as, as part of the Windows 10 anniversary update that has some container services um, that you can enable. And I, we can put some, some links in the show notes to, to, so folks know how to do this. So I have Docker running on this, on this Windows 10 machine. Yeah. It has a couple different modes it can run in. Uh, one is the ability, I, I can run it in a mode that actually provides me the ability to run Linux-based containers or uh, Windows-based containers. So I'm going to run the na Windows uh, Microsoft Nano server, which is certainly a, you know, a Windows-based container. So that's the mode that I'm running in now, but I can actually switch over to, to Linux um, you know, by right-clicking on that. So what I'm going to do, what this command does, is, uh, so the Docker, the command line utility that I use to interact with that, that Docker engine that I talked about on the other slide. Yeah. And I'm going to run this interactive, that's what the IT is, this interactive um, container for, uh, with nano server on it. And I'm going to run specifically the, the, the command prompt. So uh, when I run, hit enter, um, it'll take a minute here. Maybe a couple of minutes. <laughs> it's usually so pretty the, quick. Launching nano server so that we can get to the nano server command prompt. You you got it. That's that's exactly what it's doing. So when so you'll see my sh my prompt actually change from this PowerShell prompt to a Nano Server prompt, and this is and you'll be able to to see that it really is a an isolated environment from my machine. And actually, just for while we wait, I'm going to bring up another. Um, so so it seems like the benefit is that it uses less resources. It's less memory hungry. I'm not having to run two full copies of the OS. Exactly. Yes. Yep. Okay. So, Lex, I, I fired up just another PowerShell command prompt so we can kind of you know poke into what's running um, in the window behind. But um, so I, I'm, what I'm doing here is I'm, I'm displaying the directory contents of my local uh, my local machine. You know, so I see debuggers, inetpub, you know, various directories that I have on here. Um, and I can also I can, I can get rid of that Windows.old directory for you if you want. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. I do. I uh, you know, obviously had a recent uh, recent push of of, uh, of of a Windows OS update on that. Yeah, I, I do need to blow that guy away. <laughs> yeah. Um, so if I run this uh, Docker ps command, it'll actually show me that I do actually have a nano server actively running. Uh, you know, two, uh, just a couple minutes ago. Um, so I, you know, I actually am able to use that command line environment to actually, you know, see what's running and see see what different different um, you know applications or, or containers specifically they have deployed. So if I jump over to my nano server and look at what's on here, I don't see any of the directories that I showed on my local machine. So this is actually an isolated container. Um, you can actually deploy applications into this container, so I can actually take this image from the, the uh, Docker image gallery, and I can mm -hmm. deploy my web application too. I can configure it to, you know, have IIS in it, um, you know, or, or Node or, you know, Python, you know, whatever type of, of um, you know, application server you can think of, or even other, you know, non-web-based, you know, applications. I can deploy to this image, and I can actually save this image and, you know, share it with, with my teammates, you know, share it with other developers, you know, give this image maybe to, uh, the DevOps guys to actually deploy in a production environment. So lots of different ways that you can use this. But right now, this is just a pristine Windows Nano Server environment um, that actually has nothing installed on it. And you can see just from the directory that you know that's as proof that it's it's um, isolated. So it has a different registry hive and has a different file system um, than what's running on my local machine. Even though I, I'm again not running a true hypervisor. So this isn't a VM. This is just a, a Docker image. If it would have been a virtual machine, it would have taken significantly 
uh, you know, longer to actually boot up. I would have had to wait for, you know, the operating system boot and, you know, all of the other, you know, post processes that, that the uh, VM would have to go through. So essentially we just virtualize the command prompt? Yeah, in a way. Yeah, you could, yeah. Just, instead just, of just, instead yeah. of virtualizing an entirely separate instance of the OS. Yeah, exactly. So, so still using, you know, my, you know, my, the kernel of the, my, um, you know, my corporate issued laptop, you know, and uh, the, the network interface and all of that, that stuff. Um, but it's just not, you know, as heavy weight as running a full blown VM. Yeah, that's cool. Yeah. yeah. All right. So, um, so if you think about, you know, some of the, the things that you can do with that, um, I'm going to go ahead and just type exit, and this is actually going to go right back to. So now my the container is actually terminated now, and I'm I'm running back on my you know my local machine, and um, you know, because the, the prompt changed from a command prompt to a PowerShell prompt. So you can there's another tool called Docker Compose that actually allows you to take um, you know, just stitch together things. I mean, think about a typical web application. You have you know a database server and uh, you know web server. You know maybe some you know the actual web application. Um, so there's right, different different services that are essentially um, running. Right. Exactly. Machines. Yep. So so there I've actually pre-created this this. Um, uh, this configuration file, and it's called a, a YML file. I'm going to go ahead and make the font a little bit bigger for our viewers at home. Okay. And what this has in it are some instructions that tells the Docker engine what I need for this application. All right, so so in that configuration file, I showed you know that I have a WordPress application that needs MySQL. Well, I can actually get those images um, independently or individually. You know, so in this case, I can just type in the Docker command. There's a a pull command that actually has uh, just pulls down an image, doesn't necessarily run it. Um, so if I if I run uh, you know Docker pull MySQL, I already have MySQL the MySQL image running on my machine or pulled down on my machine, and I can actually see that if I do. Uh, Docker images, and you can see the the images that I actually have on my machine. You know, I have this Nano server. I've got one I was playing with earlier. Um, then I have a repository called Web Server. A Web Server is the one is a configuration file I was just showing you, um, and what that has in it is MySQL. So that's why it told me that I already had my MySQL installed locally in my machine. So it's part of that other package, if you will. You know, the, the my WordPress package. Okay. Um, so in here, so I'm, I'm telling what version I want, um, you know, where it's actually going to be, um, you know, putting or where the database resides. You know, you see my super secret uh, root password and database passwords, um, and you can also see, um, you know, that I'm, I'm telling it that I, I want to install WordPress and that it's dependent upon the the database service. So you know, this is going to be installed in one container, and WordPress will be installed in another container. And they'll be able to communicate with one another over you know this this um, you know NAT uh, network interface that Docker actually creates. So the services can, can uh, communicate with one another. But then I also I can actually communicate with those containers as well. That we'll see when I actually fire this guy up. All right. So now so I uh, I have this configuration file that I was showing uh, you know that I already, I just showed you a moment ago that it kind of defines. All of the you know the, my, the MySQL environment and my um, uh, the WordPress site that I want to stand up. So I'm going to run this Docker Compose, which right. actually will, will use that configuration file to, to get those two images and actually stitch them all together. So the command I need to type is this Docker Compose, uh, and this will actually look in my um, oh, you know what? So the, I'm actually running in Windows mode. So I need to actually. So this is a Linux-based container. I actually need to switch over. And it's going to take a moment here. Kind of a good uh, good show for the viewers at home here. Um, so you know, previously I was running the Nano server, which is you know Windows based based container, and now I got to flip back over to the other mode. And let me run these Linux containers. Yeah, so, that's still pretty cool. I mean, it popped up and showed right. us that it was switching. Yep. So when I run this, so starting up the database, so that you if you think about um, you know, running these as a, um, I'll tell you why it failed here in a second as well. Um, if you think about running these as VMs that I would have had to stand up, you know, like a Linux VM that had MySQL on it, and a Linux VM that had, um, you know, PHP and Tomcat, you know, Apache, 
um, you know, some web server on it, um, you know, both taking up a pretty significant amount of resources. So right now I have 16 gigs of physical memory in my machine, and I only have two gigs uh, dedicated to Docker. So I'm, I just spun up a, a database server and actually two web servers, um, uh, you know, within that that two gig footprint, and I still have have uh, a room left over. Because essentially, it's just the apps that are virtualized. Yes, exactly. Yeah, yeah. So I. Um, so, and the reason why it failed is that there's actually this, um, I was playing with this a, a little bit ago, that I can actually say, um, you know, scale, um, and I can tell, so if I had a load balancer sitting in front of my website, I can actually tell the Docker engine that I want to increase the number of instances of my web application from one to five. So this is kind of where you can kind of think about you know how you can use this in a production environment where you have a pool of servers and you can you know maybe you have one service underutilized so if you want to increase the number of instances of you know the catalog service on your website you can increase that and what the what the docker environment will do is say hey this this particular server has enough resources for me to deploy more instances of your your you know web application to so it kind of does some some balancing for us my machine is um, um, you know single box. I don't have more, uh, more than one machine. Uh, so when I told it to run five instances, I'm telling the website to run on a specific port. And in this case, you know, that port is in use by the other, uh, the other instances. So it's specifically on port 8,000. Yeah. So, yeah. So, so that's, that's where we had a failure. So if I fire up a new, a new web browser here, let's go ahead and get her going. So if I go to localhost port 8000, if all goes well, we'll see a WordPress site. Yeah. yeah so, so this is a WordPress site, and I actually, um, so it actually has a little, it's, it's pre-configured, it has some data in it because I actually stored this image with all of my um, my data in it. So, like in in the case of my nano server, if I made if I edited a file in that nano server, and then started nano server back up, that file would actually be gone, unless I told Docker that I want to commit those changes to my image. So that's another cool artifact of, of containers is that they're really easy to create and destroy. So, like if you stand up an environment, deploy an application to it, and it doesn't work or you have an error. Uh, you want you can actually redeploy it to a, a brand new environment that's that's clean that doesn't have any ancillary bits or utilities you know SDKs and all the other stuff a developer typically has in their machine. Um, you can deploy it to a brand new environment and you know validate the application works. Um, and then when you're ready to actually you know move this maybe into a production environment, um, you can actually commit all of those configuration changes, you know database changes and so forth to the image, and then you can give that image to um, you know, to somebody, you know, in a DevOps role or to your, your peers or, or what have you. Um, so in this case, I actually stored the, uh, the, the changes I made to the MySQL database so I had a functioning WordPress site. Hmm. Uh, yeah, that's so th pretty cool. All right, Lex. So, so, you know, I showed a couple basic ways that you can use it on a, you know, your, your machine. And we'll, you know, definitely, you know, to show some, some other ways in which you can actually use that um, you know, in development or testing, you know, kick the tires type capacity. Yeah. As we mentioned, you know, Windows Server 2016 has container services. You know, the anniversary update of uh, Windows 10 has container services. But even cooler, you can actually spin up clusters of machines that, you know, run some, you know, commercial, um, you know, container management services in Azure. You know, specifically this Azure Container Services, and there's also a, a, a Mesosphere uh, cluster that you can deploy. So I'm just going to go ahead and show you the Windows Container Services. When you go through the wizard, if I click Create, you can define the the number of nodes that you want to have in that pool of servers, um, the size of those nodes. Um, and um, you know, provide some you know, networking configuration. I actually don't have a key that I can readily paste in here to kind of get on, get onto the next step. Um, but, but there's a really you know just a, a three-step wizard to actually build out an environment that actually has a lot of stuff in it. Now let me show you what what happens after you run this. Uh, I actually have one running here. Okay. 
So when you finish the wizard, it has a lot of um, a lot of services and in you know bits that it lays down into a resource group in Azure. And if you recall, I think we even talked about this in our earlier show. You and I had chatted. A resource group is just a container that you can drop stuff into in Azure and manage them discreetly, assign permissions to them, uh, view costs on them collectively, and so forth. So it, all of this stuff was actually provisioned for me through the through the wizard. <clears throat> um, you can certainly build one of these by hand. Uh, but the wizard, you know, does a lot of things to to uh, make that a lot easier. Um, so there, there's two different commercial, um, you know, products. Uh, one is a Mesosphere that has a, a a portal that you can use to kind of have some visibility into your cluster, kind of balance things out and see what the state, um, you know, the the health is of the, the cluster. Um, and then there's another one called Docker Swarm, which is command line based and um, you know that I, I like web web based user interfaces so I've deployed one that was using the the mesosphere and I'll show you, you know, some of the tools that you can use to kind of peer into that but what I have is a, a pretty the, the at at its root the um, the um, let me go ahead and show I actually have a slide here this is actually what a the a cluster actually uh, what the uh, template rather in Azure builds for you. So it, it builds um, you know a, a couple of groups of machines, this master group, this agent group. This is where your your containers run. This okay. is where kind of the management is done. And there's okay. a bunch of bunch of services needed to be able to make this this environment work. So, and they're actually deployed, ironically enough, as containers. So it, they're you know the service is using containers itself for the service. If that makes sense. Yeah. Um, so, and I have, um, and sitting in front of this, these agents are, is a load balancer that has a couple of ports, and you can actually open up other ports if you deploy another application to, to the, um, you know, containerized application. But by default, it opens up port 80, you know, 43, and port 8080. Um, so, what I have here is, um, actually, let me go to this screen. So, this is actually, this is the, the state of affairs on my, uh, my cluster. So I can see what the CPU utilization is. You know that I've got 12 gigs of RAM across all the nodes that are running in my uh, my application. I've got a Cassandra uh, deploy or service that's actually deployed in this cluster. Marathon. This is actually the uh, management uh, council. Remember, I said earlier that the the uh, this this Docker container services or I'm sorry, the Azure container services um, specifically with Mesos uses containers for the service. So this is actually a, a management service. This Marathon one out you'll see in a second. Um, so if you go to you know view all services, I can actually see you know what services are running and kind of the the you know CPU, you know memory and disk. I can have some visibility into the actual nodes that are running my my cluster. So you know earlier we showed all all of the command line interfaces. This is kind of the more of the uh, you know, uh, of a container service that you can use in a production manner. Okay. So Marathon is is a deployment environment that you can use to be able to see you know the applications that are running in inside of your cluster. And Cassandra is actually taking a fair amount of time to deploy. It's actually still deploying. Um, but I have a couple other things that are deployed to this cluster. You know, I have a MySQL server. I have a you know MySQL admin. And I have an Nginx, which is, um, if you don't know what Nginx is, it's a, it's a load balancer, a Unix-based load balancer, open source. Um, you know, kind of think of it as kind of a, you know, an F5, or a virtual appliance. It can do a lot of networky type things. Um, so that you know, the reason I deployed that is it's, um, it's really quick and easy to deploy. You see it only you know, has, has 16, uh, um, uh, you know, 16 uh, a megabyte footprint, so it's actually a really small image. And to actually deploy an application in this environment, you can you can pull down an image that you've already made, um, or you can actually you know provide some instructions on how to deploy an image that is um, you know available in the gallery. So like if I go, uh, just to show you what the Nginx one looks like, I actually have some of the instructions I was using earlier. Um, so this is actually JSON, a JavaScript object notation. A lot of things in Azure and some of the 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 um, you know cloud world uses JSON as a kind of the syntax or, or the format that you actually use to provide instructions or instructional metadata to services. And basically, this is saying I'm, I want to deploy an Nginx cluster. You know, has one um, you know a, a fraction of a CPU, 16 megs of RAM. And it's opening up port 80 on the container. So this is actually the the listener port that it actually listens to on that cluster of servers um, externally. 
this is actually the, the port that it connects to on this con on the container itself, the host port. So think of the host port as like the in the VM world that would be like the you know the VM uh, port on that you know this particular environment that actually is running Nginx, and the, you know these ports are used for for management um, you know in Nginx. So I already deployed it, um, and if I go to the this is this is the um, the DNS name for my uh, my cluster you know that the, there's a load balancer that Azure created sitting in front of it. And when I go to it, because it's listening on port 80, I actually get the Nginx screen. So this is actually running on my my Azure Container Services Mesos cluster in Azure. Um, this is one of the the applications that I've deployed. So it's um, it's a lot of steps ultimately just to see a, a black and white page. But you know now that it's running, you can do things like scaling it. Um, you can actually set up you know rules and automation to. You know, as I mentioned earlier, if you had a web application, maybe the checkout portion of your web application, um, you know, needs to have additional capacity. Well, you have this this pool of resources, and in a in a world where you're building applications in a in a microservices type model, where you have you know all all of the individual components of your application built as tiny services, you can actually turn the knob on just a portion of those services instead of having to spin up a you know a big beefy VM that might be very costly. Um, you can use a, just a coll collection of servers and, and just, you know, scale up the parts that need to be scaled up to accommodate whatever load um, that's coming into your website or whatever the users are doing on your website. You know, sometimes that's not even known. So is there a limit to, it sounds like maybe I can run one application per container or one service per container. Is it, am I getting that right? So um, the, the the container would be you know like an application or or maybe even just a collection of applications. I mean you can have you know my uh, you can have uh, you know a, a nano server that has you know your web application and you know has a node environment on it and so forth. So you can actually have all of the things needed to run a particular part of your application, which is typically what you would do like in a, in a microservices model where you'd have. Um, you know, service one and all of the stuff needed for service one to work in a container, and then you know, service two and all the stuff it needs in, in another container, and the, those two containers can talk to one another. Um, so, so, so I can run multiple services in a, in each container. Yeah, absolutely. Yep. So, yeah. so okay. you know, you know, that and that nano server, um, you know, situation. I mean, anything I can configure and deploy to nano server, I can package up into an image and and use that. You know, for subsequently to and deploy one or more containers. Yeah, so that's pretty cool. Yeah. All right, so um, so we can uh, let's go ahead and do some uh, some other stuff here just to show you how how you can actually use this a little bit farther. I, I'm going to go ahead. I switch back over to uh, the Windows mode. I'm just going to go ahead and go back up to a command that we had earlier where I ran uh, Nano Server. So um, what I'm going to do is. Um, I'm going to create a PowerShell script. So as I, you know, this is a, a vanilla nano server environment. You know, as I mentioned, it doesn't really have anything on it. I'm going to create a um, a PowerShell script that just says "Hello World." Um, so I'm going to go ahead and run this command here. So I'm just adding the add content is just adding this content to this this PS1 file that's going to sit in my root folder. Yep. And you're and just can, writing to the host, "Hello yeah, World." Exactly. Yep. So, and I'm going to um, save that that um, you know th this particular uh, PowerShell script to my image that I that I'm running right now. So when I run, so when I exit this, so if I were to to restart this, it would actually have a a new image, um, a, a clean image that wouldn't actually have my PowerShell script on it. But I want to do is you know take stuff that I've done to this image and now use this uh, going forward as a as you know for saying hello world to uh, to you Lex <laughs> as an example okay so, all right so so we've uh, we had our nano server image running and we um, you know we made a PowerShell commandlet and instead of resetting that environment back to just a vanilla um, you know nano server environment I'm actually you know want to store and house that PowerShell script in that in a new image that I can now um, now spin up at, at my leisure and the way that I can I can do that. Is now I can I, I tell Docker I want to run. So I, I named um, 
I know uh, you and I were chatting earlier that you see some some very you know, somewhat comical names listed here. <laughs> yeah, like Drunk Ray or Naughty Banish. <laughs> exactly. So this uh, this is the name of the of the image that we were just working with earlier, and this is actually the container ID. So I could have actually have used either one when I actually committed this this change to a new image. Um, these are just random names that uh, the Docker seems to assign if you don't if you don't give it a name. Yeah, some developers laughing at us right now. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So um, I'm going to go ahead and tell it I want to run the Hello Lex uh, image, and and what I'm going to do is tell it within that container. So there, so previously when I ran Anno Server, I actually ran it in interactive mode. So it actually gave me a command prompt. So I told it to run command and to not exit. So in this case, I'm actually going to tell it to run PowerShell and run our our Hello World. Um, PS1. All right, Lex. So uh, you know, as I was saying, that that was actually uh, you know, this is a really good way to uh, be able to to uh, you know test and validate you know something that you want to kick the tires with without um, impacting the machine that you're working on. This is you know a great way to deploy you know applications and kind of a microservices model. Um, you can also you know share these these images. Uh, you know, with um, you know, with your peers, You're, there's actually something called Docker Hub, which I didn't even really talk much about. But this is a, there's a, a public repository that has a lot of images, you know, open source images. That's where some of the um, you know, the, like Microsoft Nano Server and some of the you know the images we make available in, in Windows 10 environments, um, we, where we uh, host and maintain those. But you can actually publish in a image that you've made yourself to a repository, sort of like GitHub. And make it, you know, public for others to be able to use your image, um, or you can make it a private image or a private repository uh, yeah. that you you can use within your organization. So if somebody's watching this and they want to play with containers, they've never played with it before, um, and they just want to start from scratch, you know, how do we go about doing that? Sure. Well, there's a, there's a quick start guide on how to run this on. Uh, Windows 10 Professional um, or Enterprise specifically, you need to have the anniversary update, okay. and this allows you to run either the Linux or the Windows uh, images that we talked about today. And there's a couple of features that you need to enable. So there's some PowerShell commands. Actually, there's only two that you need to run, um, and uh, you know restart, and then you can install Docker, which is that little whale utility that I have running down here in my system tray. Yeah. Um, and um, you know, there's some configuration that you can do within Docker that, that's walked through in this in this guide. Uh, but it, and actually, some of the stuff I just showed with that Hello World is actually outlined in, in here as well. So you, so that's actually something that um, uh, you know, that somebody who wants to get started just with that very simple demo I showed, they can actually use this as a guide. Okay. Yeah, that's cool. Yeah. So. Um, yeah, you know, like I said, you you showed a picture of a container ship at the beginning. Um, in in a way, this is actually you know that container ship type mentality that you have, you know, individual applications or images that are running on top of your operating system, and instead of having to wait for the entire OS to boot and you know having a duplicate copy of you know the kernel and all of the other stuff that's needed to be able to support you know an application. So, yeah. or in our case. You know, it was a PowerShell command. Yeah, and just like a container ship, it doesn't require very many resources to uh, move it from dock to dock. Exactly, yeah. So, you know, everything shares that underlying engine that's on the container ship, and they're just I, right, I you know, think, along for the I ride. Think there's like, I think there's like eight people on a container ship, <laughs> at least on that one. Uh, yeah. It yeah. sank, and, and I saved all eight, so we're good. <laughs> all right. <laughs> that's awesome. Yeah. So, hey, man, listen, thanks for doing this again. Um, you know, you're a regular on the show. Yep. <laughs> uh, just leave it in. I don't care. Yeah. <laughs> uh, you're a regular on the show. And, uh, you know, I certainly appreciate having you uh, come and do these uh, for us. So uh, start thinking about your next one because I'm definitely going to have you on again. Sure. No. No problem. And like I said, you know, I, I just tried to simplify it because containers is kind of is a hot topic now. And yeah. when you look at the demos, there's all kinds of command line stuff you have to type. And you, I mean, I did go to the command line, but it wasn't extraordinarily difficult to actually do some basic things. Um, so, you know, so I just wanted to highlight, you know, how how uh, others can actually make use of it immediately without having to have a PhD and and uh, or, or a captain's license for driving a container ship. Yeah. No, I think this is awesome. Um, yeah. 
And, and you know, you, you pointed out that the big benefit was, you know, a lot less resources on your local box because essentially you're just kind of virtualizing portions of the OS that you need to run specific applications. Exactly. Uh, yep. Yep. For. Yeah. Okay. Well, listen, thanks again. Um, I appreciate you taking the, the time to do this. Um, great, you know, great delivery. I certainly uh, learned a lot from it. Hopefully everybody else out there did. Um, and if you have any questions, just let us know. Uh, that's your taste of premiere.